the long experience of time, nothing has interested man more than the mystery of time itself. From the very beginning, the human being realized that he was being moved along through space on the surface of a mysterious current which carried him to whatever destiny was peculiar to his kind. And in very early days, Philosophical thinking was directed upon an effort to determine the substance of the time equation. A great many conclusions were reached. They are not in agreement, but each one is in some way related to the experience of man himself. To man, time is important because of what it means to him. He cannot experience time equations in space, nor does he know what time may mean to creatures totally different from himself. Probably among the most basic attitudes about this developed a great many astronomical concepts. Uh, the effort to determine the proper measurement of this passing of time. A man realized finally that he could examine this mystery on two levels. One, his own contact with time, and the other, the vast measure of sequences of duration as these were set forth by celestial phenomena. We began to conceive, conceive the mystery of seasons, of years, and gradually of great astronomical cycles like the Platonic year. Until finally among the Brahmins perhaps the time equation was brought to its most monumental development when the ancient Hindus attempted to calculate the duration of the solar system and came to the conclusion that it would last for 4,320,000,000 years. Naturally, time of this proportion is simply beyond us. We cannot experience it, nor can we experience intelligibly the more minute aspects of this cycle. Time as it affects the cells in the human body, time as it affects the atoms dancing in space. And yet everywhere, all things that have form live within boundaries of time and place. And for everything there is a duration. And in an attempt to identify objects, or to identify beings, or to clarify relationships, we think within the grand pattern of the time, place, displacement, which things have as their unique quality. The problem of time also caused man to wonder whether time had any existence outside of himself as a fact. And he gradually came to conclude that it did. He observed other things beside himself, subject to seasons, subject to birth, growth, and decay, which take place within time. He finally observed that all species and types have their proper seasons and their durations in time. The creatures come to different ages according to their species. So whether these be legitimate evidences of time, man assumed that time existed apart from himself. 
Yet he was perfectly willing to accept the time was mostly important to him because of the interpretation which he placed upon it. Later he began to speculate as to whether time was a thing, a substance, or merely a motion, or an interval. We have begun to be very cautious in accepting the idea of vacuum. Time after time we observe that when we say that a thing has no existence, we discover that it has. So perhaps the ancients were not entirely incorrect in speculating as to whether time had an essential nature of its own, whether in truth it was a living principle, or whether it was merely a measure, whether time came into existence because of creation, or whether creation came into existence because of time. If time has a substance, nature, or essence of its own, it must then participate in universal consciousness. If universal consciousness, per se, is aware of time, its very awareness makes time a being or a living thing. If universal consciousness is essentially timeless, as many schools of philosophy have affirmed, then time arises on the illusional level of things, coming into existence because of relationships. If this is true, time may still be a kind of psychological entity. It must be something because we struggle with it constantly. And it is inconceivable that we struggle with that which has no existence of any kind. Yet man struggles with opinions which are without substance. He struggles with fears which have no reality except in himself. Therefore man can struggle with things that are not truly factual, even though they may appear to be real to himself. The time may have many dimensions, as been suggested by the researches of men like Einstein. The time may have creativity. The time may have strange interludes within itself, which may sustain forms of life that we know nothing about. The time in its relationship with motion may result in the objectification of creation. All of these speculations are reserved for those who have peculiar interests in particular subjects. Broadly speaking, Greek philosophy divided time into two important equations. The Greeks recognized a time which is flowing forever through space, like a great river, a river which carries all life upon its surface or within its substance. They also recognized another kind of time, which never changed, but remained, so to say, frozen or suspended. That there was a time that was passing, and a time that was never passing. There was a mysterious problem of the impact of these two kinds of time upon each other. And one kind of time gave man the experience that he knows in daily living. Attunement with the other kind of time gave him the mystical experience, or the apperception of timelessness. He began to speculate within himself as to the possibility of escaping time. And this forced him to analyze his own nature, for there were parts of himself which could not escape time. There might also be within him a mysterious power, an entity or a being that was timeless. It came therefore to the gradual conclusion of the Greek mind that spirit or being is timeless, that all of its manifestations are within time, and therefore that the escape from time, like the escape from ignorance, is by way of release of the spiritual life within the individual and his gradual reunion 
with an eternal pattern existing in space. Time, we know, like all of the other terms that we use, has these two important phases. We think of time flowing into eternity. And we think of eternity as the absolute of time. Therefore, things have an existence in time and a continuance or endurance in eternity. Now, all these speculations are intriguing, but they will not solve the problems that face the average person here and now. Therefore, on a practical level, where our principal concern is at the moment, we must analyze time in its effect upon man, and particularly the concept of time as it influences the living and thinking and feeling of the average individual. We are all born within a kind of environment. This environment is not only family and friends. This environment is nature. It is the larger universal in which we exist. Man cannot, therefore, build a philosophy of life or develop his own resources entirely apart from his experience of the greater universal forces and pressures which surround him. From the beginning, then, man became acutely time-conscious so far as his own existence is considered. He knew, for example, that he had a certain allotment of time, whether this allotment was a few years, or the three score and ten, or four score, or perhaps even a phenomenal five score. He knew, however, that his continuance here had limitations and boundaries upon it, and that these boundaries were constantly revealed to him through the ticking of a watch. He began to analyze this allotment. He began to realize how he uses it. And he became keenly aware that under a normal way of life, whatever time allotment he had, he lost a third of it in sleep. Therefore, his actual time allotment was less than the years which he measured by his birthday. For within each of these years, there were hours, weeks, and actually months in which he was not objectively functioning. Knowing very little about subjective functioning, he was unable to estimate any value upon this time in which he was not aware even of time. He then began to realize that in this time allotment he must also subtract those years in which through infancy and early childhood and growth his time allotment was not active, was not purposeful, and that during these years he existed in time, but he could only wait. He could only allow nature's processes to mature him and bring him into adult life. He also realized that in the closing years of life, time also began to exercise a strange restraint upon him, until finally, many years perhaps, would be comparatively unfruitful, and that therefore his actual time allotment of useful, living, working time was considerably less than his first optimism might have suggested. He then goes on in his speculation to recognize the conflict between his own purposes and this time allotment. And out of this conflict came a strange sense of hate. The individual began to realize that he did not have forever to accomplish the particular purposes that immediately concerned him. He did not have forever to establish himself in business, to raise a family. He 
did not have forever to be associated with his children, with his family, and with his friends. He did not have forever to make his own dreams come true. He did not have forever in which to achieve philosophy, religion, and all of the higher branches of learning. He also began to notice more and more the hopeless incompatibility between his own consciousness potential and his time allotment. He was surrounded by innumerable interesting things. There was so much to learn, so many things to do, so many wonderful privileges available to him, and time was short. This led inevitably to a certain kind of discrimination. He had to determine or decide the things he would try to do. He had to try, if possible, to arrange a pattern in which a reasonable achievement was possible within an available time allotment. Man also came to the conclusion, as he experimented along through the years, that his own attitude had a great deal to do with his experience of this time allotment. He was told, and he could prove mathematically, that every hour had 60 minutes in it. And yet, hours could be so different. Some hours, it would seem, never passed. They continued on and on and on. These were hours of pain, hours of fear, hours of loneliness, hours of misery. These hours were much more than 60 minutes each, as far as psychological experience is concerned. Then there were other hours that passed far too rapidly. Hours of success, of joy, of love and affection, of regard. Hours in which the individual was busy, not thinking about himself, but advancing causes and ends with which he was concerned. These hours did not seem to have more than 10 or 15 minutes in them. They went by so rapidly that he was never able to accomplish what he had hoped to do. Then there were other kinds of hours that had an effect upon him. He observed the general trend throughout living of the weight of hours and the time value of hours constantly changing. The hours of childhood are longer than those of maturity. And after the individual reached his middle life, it seems that time takes wings. And the person finds less and less available time. His interests become more diversified. His activities cause him to be less and less conscious of the time e equation. And so suddenly he realizes that a year is gone, that five years are gone. And perhaps he wonders how long it will be before he is gone. These time factors, then, exercise a constant and powerful pressure upon the internal psychic integration of the person. They cause him to have attitude. They cause him also uh, to struggle desperately like a drowning man against the encroachments of time. We also have another interesting phenomena that we observe around us in society, and that is the apparent uh, inequality of the time equation allotment. There are people wandering around this world with nothing to do. They simply can find no subject of any interest. The only thing they are really concerned with is killing time. And they murder it brutally on some occasions. Uh, they go on, they try to find some pleasant way to waste the years that they have. These individuals are forever complaining that life is not interesting, that it is a bore and a burden, or they are seeking forever to get their minds off of useful action. To them, time is something that must be endured, must be patiently or impatiently sustained until it reaches its end. Many of these individuals 
are simply waiting for the end. Because there seems to be no real purpose in life. We compare these with a man like Thomas Edison, who struggles so desperately to rescue a few more hours out of each day because of the tremendous intensity of his activity. He needed time. He wanted it. He felt that the things that he uh, was doing were important and that these things demanded time in order that he might be of greater service to humanity. Sometimes it appears that folk live too long. Other times it seems that they do not live long enough. Yet they all live within this one basic tyranny, and regardless of how they measure their time or use it, the little clock ticks on with a strange impersonal regularity. And each individual, willingly or unwillingly, faces an hour of sixty minutes. And within this, he must achieve or accomplish certain things. Time has become of great importance on an industrial level. Today we buy the time of other human beings. We buy what we call their energy and their labor but we buy it by the hour. We buy it not in terms of its own substance, but in terms of its application within a pattern of time establishment. Time also comes in upon us forcibly in the timetable, in the uh, plans for communication and transportation. We are living in a time-bound world. And what does this do to us? How does it affect our own sense of individual existence? It would seem from his career and his characteristics since the beginning that man was created, or at least early conditioned, uh, by forces which gave him an inferiority complex. The individual has always been by nature fatalistic. He has always sensed within himself restriction, boundaries which he cannot break through, and his entire life has been overshadowed by the immensity of the universe in which he lives and the comparative ineffectiveness of himself. The burden would have been much heavier had the average person been more thoughtful. He was saved, however, because of a general indifference. And even today, consciously, a great many persons do not accept the frustration of environment or the limitations imposed upon them by forces beyond their control. Yet this equation does exist, and it is somewhere locked within the nature of man and it is undoubtedly one of the principal contributing causes for man being what he is as a creature, as a creator, as an instrument, and as a living being. Time, then, must have a part to play in the lives of all of us, and it does. We have appointments to keep. We have various time allotments. Rent comes due in time. Taxes are due in time. And time now is measured also by debt, for the very process of living creates economic responsibility. We have to buy time by buying food and shelter. For if we are unable to provide these things, we are unable to function within the time allotment. We are also constantly struggling to attain a kind of freedom which is defined in terms of a time to do as we please. We have observed furthermore that individuals with too much time to do as they please are not always the fortunate ones. We know from experience that the average person does not know how to use time which is not already planned. 
Thus the larger motions of society continue because they are boundaries with plans. There are things to be done at certain times. They are done and continuance is assured. Every so often, however, the individual, through his industry or through circumstances, finds himself holding in his hand a time allotment which is not planned. Maybe 15 minutes, maybe a weekend, it may be a year, or it may be that magnificent retirement that folks look forward to. But it is time to do as we please. Time to use to our own pleasure or to give to the pleasure of others. Time for improvement, relaxation, rest. Time for the development of those instincts, ideals and attitudes uh, which are not properly matured during the activities of daily living. This time to do as we please was termed by Aristotle leisure and still is true as was in Greece that leisure is the most difficult burden that man must bear. We like to think of leisure as something we could all use wonderfully. But we do not. And although we have considerable time of leisure and our entire economic and industrial setup is now calculated to increase leisure, by shortening working hours, speeding transportation, and variously liberating man from bondage and drudgery, still the time-leisure equation is not solved. The use of leisure should be as important as the cost of attaining it. Man has to work very hard for his day off unless he belongs to a very small minority of completely leisured persons who incidentally seldom make good use of time, the individual must sacrifice for leisure. He works for it. He saves for it. He gives many efforts and energies to attain it. And what does he do with it? Up to the moment, the problem of leisure is the problem of civilization. For whereas industry is developed in labor, culture is developed in leisure. And without leisure, man cannot attain a thoughtfulness, or discrimination, or reflection, or the values of a contemplative existence. So the problem of working for and fighting for leisure emerges as the mind of man broadens its interests and becomes more and more concerned with things that are not completely economic or industrial. This struggle to understand the leisure equation also has much to do with man's time equation measurement. He has observed and discovered, for example, that leisure is rooted in an attitude. It is rooted in a recognition or realization of something. And this realization particularly deals with haste. Leisure is opposed to the concept of haste. To the individual, leisure represents usually rest or relaxation. It is escape from drive. Some persons, however, find the use of leisure requires the re-establishment of drive. They have to be busy or they cannot enjoy leisure. Also, leisure becomes merely a symbol of the individual doing what he pleases, whereas labor becomes a symbol of doing what he must do in order to survive. Man has also gradually realized that he can outwit, at least in part, some of the restrictions of time pressure by relaxation. He observes that tension causes him to waste time. 
to confuse value, and that the individual takes longer to do things if he does them under tension. This means that he must devote more time to the correction of his own mistakes. When a situation like this becomes obvious in society, and it is very obvious today, we realize that much of our so-called leisure is now being wasted because of lack of interest, lack of integrity, and lack of sincerity in the doing of those things that must be done. The person takes less and less interest in his work less interest in the various activities necessary for his economic maintenance. And because he does things badly, he must do them many times. Thus he uses up further energy and time allotment. Efficiency is almost always attained by the individual first achieving integration, relaxation, organization of his own faculties, so that it is possible for him to do each thing in a thoughtful and planned manner with the least possible waste motion. We have this very frequently brought to our attention in the planned living of modern man. Some persons take much longer to maintain an establishment, keep house, cook meals, or go from one place to another by transportation. Some take much longer than others. The planned person saves time. The individual who has order finds himself uh, conserving both energy and existence in time. There are cases where it has been demonstrated clearly, for example, that organization, well established, carefully thought through, and quietly and efficiently carried out, will save from a half to two-thirds of a time allotment. This time is then available for other purposes. But the average person is not much concerned over this because he does not have other adequate purposes. And it makes little difference to him whether he wastes time by doing things badly or whether he wastes it trying to enjoy himself. In either instance, he is not achieving uh, any particular commendable end. Time also begins to cause us to conceive the problem of age. We divide life according to its time allotments, and we find ourselves drifting slowly into a time shortage. And here we recognize more than perhaps at any other period in life, the value of time and how important it becomes as the supply obviously diminishes. Some persons take this as a fatalistic circumstance. There are a great many people who will attempt nothing, build nothing, create nothing after a certain period of life because of time discouragement. They feel that they have no chance of succeeding or finishing or completing because of lack of time. Opposed to these is a small and rather intelligent group that takes the attitude that the end is not important, that the most important thing is the doing of something, the building, whether we live to see the end product or not, we should still continue with every reasonable and possible activity and continue to plan, continue to learn, and continue to grow to the last moment of life. These individuals certainly have a better time, and they also enjoy leisure and are able to use it to the advancement of their various interests and activities. All of this brings another important end to our consideration. We know that inevitably, regardless of any hope, dream, belief, doubt, or fear, that whatever we are doing must sometime be set aside. We know that at some time, some day, 
We will lay down the instruments of our craft, whatever it may be, and find that we are departing from the scene of our labor. Thus we are always under the tyranny of incompleteness. We shall never live to see the fullness of our work, if the work was ever worth the doing. This, in turn, has a tendency to cause us to wonder about future, and from the limitation of time, we begin to construct overtones, these overtones including a concept of eternity. Man requires this concept to, ba to battle the phenomenon of time. He must believe that there is something beyond the limitation of time. His philosophy, his religion, even his science make it desirable or even necessary to assume that the life of the individual extends beyond his physical time allotment. If such is not the case, then life as an interlude or as a physical existence becomes meaningless, purposeless, and inevitable in its dramatic end, which is incompleteness. So the person cannot conceive of this total extinction of his own purpose. He can and does accept the inevitability of transition from a present environment to some other environment. But he is unwilling to assume that this transition destroys his existence within the sequence of time, that time must go on beyond him, and that he must go with it. The time should go on and he should cease is simply not conceivable as an experience by man. He experiences within himself, gradually through the course of life, untime-bound experiences or timelessness. He observes within himself moments which cannot be measured. He finds in the dream sequence, for example, that in a few seconds he can live a lifetime. Also that he may, by converse analysis of his own conduct, realize that in a lifetime he has lived only a few seconds. He discovers then that time has another meaning, and that is that in some way it is a measure of events. Without event, there is no time, as he understands it. There is a mere aging within his own nature. History is measured by dates, by occurrences, and divisible into eras and epochs, uh, such as the classical world or the Roman Empire. These things are sequences in time, and by means of these sequences man orients himself historically. By the other types of records he orients himself archaeologically. He becomes part of an unfolding world that has existed for millions and hundreds of millions of years and he becomes aware of his relationship to the totality by means of his time orientation. Thus also he becomes aware that time not only is an experience of flowing from one condition to another, but that this flowing is always through a mysterious point, a focal point, which we term now. The individual beginning to analyze himself uh, begins to suspect that he has not lived through a past to a present and hopes to extend into a future. What he is really doing, he is living constantly in a little instant called now. All the nows that have gone before him are the past and history. The nows which have not yet come are the future. But even as he is defining the word now, the instant has moved into the past and a new now has come into existence. 
Man has only one field of consciousness orientation, and that is now. He can remember the past, but he cannot actively revitalize it. When he tries to do so by forcing his various retentive faculties, he heads into psychological difficulty. He cannot live in the future. He can dream about the future. He can hope for the future. He can try to visualize himself in a future state. But he is still visualizing with the power of now. And when this new state does become now, so many situations have changed that his previous visualization is imperfect. So regardless of all his experiences, man in consciousness is always living now. He is always living in an instant, a moment. And what he terms life is a sequence of these nows each one tumbling to take the place of another. There is nothing deader than yesterday. There is nothing more remote, strangely enough, than unborn tomorrow. Yesterday has been, tomorrow will be, but now is. And this strange sense of isness, this imminent vitality, this all of life living itself in the instant, has given rise to a great many concepts about man's possibility of capturing the concept of now. Perhaps now is the only time there is, and that the past is merely the memory of now, and that the future is the hope of now. But that this moment, with all of its implications and its imponderables, alone is real. Now, if this is true, then time is essentially a focal point in the consciousness of man. And assuming such to be possible, let us consider its effect upon the daily life of the individual. We have said that we have all been indoctrinated for so long a time, subconsciously and archetypally, by time sequences, that we are under the hypnosis of this concept of time forever moving through space. This concept in us is so deep-rooted that we cannot completely destroy it. We cannot escape from it entirely. The only thing we can combat it with at all is this eminent concept of now. Because now is an experienced moment. And nearly all other time cannot be visually or factually experienced by the individual. Suppose, therefore, that we assume, with the Greek, that now is the reality of time, and that man has brought into existence a strange psychology of dividing now into parts. And because he has made these divisions, he has come under the tyranny of them. He accepts them. He believes that they must be true. Therefore, he lives by them. That such things could happen, we know to be true. Because we know, for example, the effect of social pattern upon mankind. We know how the world, the situation of nations, the civilization in which we exist, the nation of which we are a citizen, how all these environmental processes and factors affect us and cause us to have certain attitudes that become stronger in reality than the attitude of life itself. Thus, under any prevailing attitude, Man is strongly influenced and begins to believe this influence to be inevitable. If this influence is now separated from all nation, all race, and becomes man's most basic allotment, having been his common experience throughout all time, then 
we can realize how tremendously vital, how deep-seated the time psychosis could be. And we call it a psychosis because it is, in many ways, a terrible and evil thing that man has allowed to dominate his entire concept of life. He has built a prison wall of days and months and years and has become hopelessly involved in this prison. He has seen time, mostly as past or future. He has not oriented to time as now. Thus the individual is torn between, between his regrets for the past and his hopes for the future, and being thus torn, fails to do anything now. Or he is completely overshadowed by the cultures of the past or predictions and prophecies of the millennium to come and does nothing now. He is therefore inclined to be a historian, which is the study of the now, of the past, and in which case he goes back and seeks himself, steeps his mind and everything that he is in the past until he knows far more about the Greco-Roman culture than he knows about now. He might make an excellent citizen of Greece, but unfortunately the Greece which he is studying ceased to exist 2,000 years ago, and therefore he is not a well-adjusted citizen of now. Now the past is one nostalgia that we live by, the future is another. The future is always a sphere of wish fulfillment. It is the place where the individual who does nothing now is going to be amply rewarded for it. <laughs> it is where he is going to not only reap a rich harvest, but he is going to reap it without doing any particular sowing. Always the future is an escape on the basis that tomorrow is a new day, things will be different. And on the basis of things being different and positing our hopes devoutly upon the United Nations, we hope for the future and do very little now. Now we continue our conspiracies. Our benevolences will be considered tomorrow. Thus we are plagued with the peculiar situation that the future is forever becoming now. And it is empty because we put nothing in it. Nothing tangible. We fill it with hopes, therefore we continue to be disillusioned. When if we had built firmly for it, now it would have become capable of giving us additional factual support. So even though we may be interested, and quite rightly so, in the past, because it is the parent of ourselves, and because of the future which is the child of today, we may be profoundly concerned with it. But this concern should always be focused upon now. What does the past mean to us now? That is its utility. What is the thing we can do now which will affect the future? That is our way of building. But the stones must always be placed now. For whenever the stone is placed, is now. It can never be placed except now. And although we may wait for a hundred years to place it, the moment it is placed is now. And upon that instant placing becomes the possibility of few further levels and more stones. But the next one cannot be placed until we have placed ours. Thus now goes into every extremity of life. And now slowly bursts upon the individual under certain conditions. He discovers that now has a tremendous depth a vast breadth, and that if there is an eternity anywhere in time, that eternity is now. 
and that the difference between past, present, and future lies in the fact that between past and present, uh, between past and future, and where they overlap, is a mysterious point of eternity that has whatever dimension, whatever proportion, we are able to recognize. If we study psychology in connection with the individual, we learn constantly of how man compromises now. He is always suffering now for what happened some other time. His past is catching up with him. His past is overshadowing now. Bad habits are perverting the action of now. He is unable to meet now because of debilities, fixations, opinions, or attitudes which injure his relationship to the immediate and simple action that is required to make now a vital experience. If men could do right now, in a very short span of time, all history would change. It is because a few men did right in the past, an occasional one does it today, and we hope that more will do it in the future, that we have no integration on the level of achieved virtues. Everything in our own nature focuses the resources that we possess to the immediate action of now. And if that action is inadequate, then we are inadequate, regardless of what else we may know about something else. So the end of all wisdom, so to say, is that man shall have available to him that which is necessary for the correct action now. And if this action is in any way limited or imperfect, the experience gained now becomes immediately available to the next now, which is coming even as we talk about the previous one. This problem, then, of unfolding the core of now causing it to expand until it involves or encloses past and future. And so past and future are recognized for what they truly are, merely, merely the overtone and undertone of now. If we can gain that recognition or realization, we begin to possess a contemporary existence. Now a true contemporary existence is an orientation, not a mere belligerence. There are a great many people trying to be contemporary and making a terrible mess out of it. They are worshipping now, discarding everything else and living just as badly today as they ever did. This is not the answer. The adjustment of the person with now is a great adjustment involving profundities of attainment uh, which challenge our resources and abilities constantly. The individual who lives irresponsibly and says that it is because he is living now is foolish because all irresponsibility is a debt that must be accepted by the so-called future nows as they come into immediate existence. Therefore, the action of the individual now must be such at all times that if this now was eternity, it would still be right. Until this attainment is achieved, men must learn. An adjustment of time is a challenge by which man discovers his own ineptitude and his own inabilities. Let us assume for a moment, however, that we still remember the past and we still dream of the future, but we take the weight and put it now. We're not going to get rid of all these pasts and 
not going to be able to give up all these futures easily. In fact, perhaps it is good that we do retain certain semi-real understandings and relations with them. It is the point of emphasis, the tremendous center of awareness that must some way be tied to now. The moment, for example, we could lift the memory uh, from lament lamentation over the past to the recognition of immediate opportunity, we would probably cut down mental disease and psychic and psychological problem in this country by 75 to 80 percent. It is all dealing in some way with a tyranny of something that is not now <coughs> upon that which is now. Fulfilling Plato's famous adage, which has had so many interpretations, namely that the living are ruled by the dead. The individual who is ruled by his own past is ruled by that which is factually dead, but with which he is able to contaminate the present and even pollute the future if he keeps on trying hard enough. The moment we take the center of awareness away from past and place it now, the individual can say to himself, yes, I did make the mistake, and I'm trying to correct it, and the only time to correct it is now, and the only time to prove that it is corrected is by present circumstance. The centering of all resources, using the memory principally to remember how to do things better now because of previous education, knowledge and experience. Now all these experience factors may not be legitimate, all the education may not have been purposeful, but at the same time if we can move the center of awareness so that instead of being centered in an ancient hurt, we are centered in a present opportunity, we might assume that a great many things could happen. We know, for example, that in the older days, not so very long ago, in fact, there used to be in the old diamond mountains of Korea, a great many old scholars and sages who still find them in different parts of China. China, for some reason, has had a tremendous record for longevity in spite of the high death rate. It is true that the average Chinese has not nearly our expectancy for physical survival due to the com comparatively inadequate uh, hygienic conditions of the country. But off in the mountains where the old scholars are, there are certainly some records that could cause us to pause and think. Now, I'm not speaking about anything supernatural or anything of that nature, but it is not uncommon up in those mountains to find a kindly old scholar with perhaps only one tooth left, but otherwise in pretty fair shape, who is 130, 140, or 150 years old. And he has fair probabilities of lasting for a while yet. Travelers and persons wandering around seeking various types of information have interviewed these people to try to find out why they have this peculiar longevity. And the one thing that was common to all of them was the fact that these old gentlemen simply refused to worry. They refused to be possessed by these noble and exciting attitudes which we regard as indispensable to human character. They refuse to struggle and to fight over life. They refuse to be concerned because other people did not agree with them. They had decided long ago that it was better to live quietly than to be successful and have ulcers. So these old gentlemen lived a quiet life without regret and without fear. They were not afraid they were going to die. They were not afraid they were going to have to live a little longer. A 
occasionally they would be called in by the villagers nearby to settle some weighty equation, but they declined empirically to run for public office. They would not take on such problems. Their purpose was to use the consciousness that they had to exemplify and demonstrate their own ability to survive and the laws governing survival. Now we may say that these could be very selfish people. Some of them probably are. But as occasionally we do know that they become quite useful people. But one thing that they are most useful for is to point out an object lesson. And that object lesson is that the individual who is dominated by pressure plays into the hands of time and shortens his own life. This brings us to the great Western impasse. How can an individual live successfully without pressure? That is the big question. But the West has never been able to prove that any individual ever lived successfully with pressure. He merely killed himself in a gradual and genteel manner. And if it was gradual enough and genteel enough, he might have left a comparatively large estate for his heirs to become pressureful over. We have never proved that man can break the essential pattern of nature successfully. It is nice to please men, but it is necessary to please nature if we wish to survive. Now it may well be that through the process of evolution, as some mystics and philosophers have pointed out, the great pressureless life can come into existence. A life in which there is no limitation upon attainments. That all attainments are advanced, and yet the consciousness is without pressure. This again becomes a problem of ego, for nearly all pressure centers in the individual's personal pride. Personal selfishness, personal self-centeredness. And the person whose mind is not upon himself but upon what he is doing is always less pressured than the one who has his mind totally and constantly on what life is doing to him. So in the problem of time, there is a very possible concept which is suspected in the writings of Lao Tzu the great Chinese mystic. Namely, that man can open the door of now and step into eternity. That he can step into eternity without death. That he can step into a greater measure of life. Now he will step into the experience of eternity. And this does not necessarily mean that he will step into physical immortality. Because he lives in a house that is curiously and inevitably bound to the duration of things in nature. On the other hand, it is quite possible to abuse a piece of property so completely that it will run down far before its time. <clears throat> there are houses that are five years old that are already wrecks right here in our fair community. There are others which are 30 or 40 years old that have been magnificently kept up and are in good condition and better than anything you can build today. That depends upon the tenant and how the property is administered. The same thing is true with the human being. The problem is not the attainment of physical immortality, but the attainment of comparative integration, organization, and harmony between person and body. And this is certainly to be advanced by removal of psychic stress. And psychic stress is nearly all defense against the past or escape into the future. And when we don't have to escape from anything and we do not have to defend anything, we live now. It is the use of energy for penetration rather than for apology. And if we apologize forever, 
it is no indication that we have actually changed any of the bad habits for which we are apologizing. It requires so long for the human being to reach maturity that it is conceivable that through the gradual integration of consciousness, not immediate, but gradual, with man by degrees breaking down the time psychosis within his own nature, that he ultimately can make a marked change in the physical expectancy of living. There is no reason with the equipment that man has that he should be exhausted and finished at 65, 70, 75, or 80. He should be able gradually to lengthen life by psychological means, even as he has already lengthened life expectancy by scientific means. By scientific means, he is protecting the body and preserving it. But by his psychology, he is tearing it down from inside. And while he continues to do this, he will continue uh, to lose the benefits of a large part of his lifespan. This is true especially in older years, which should be the years of greatest contemplation. But because the individual has not set the proper foundation, these years, which should be the climax and culmination of the importance of living, are very often years of misery, discomfort, and uh, fatigue. So the person through the contemporary focus may achieve, as Lao Tse explains it, the recognition or realization of Tao. And Tao is time as eternity, time forever. Time as a dimension of consciousness. Time no longer bounded by years and places, but gradually unfolding the full potential of an eternal now. An eternal now in which the total experience of existence can be experienced. That as man escapes from past and future, he begins to restore his orientation as a citizen of a total universe. And as universal experience is possible to man, as the great mystics and such teachers as Buddha has pointed out, we can conceive that this time equation can be beaten, not by breaking it, but by completely fulfilling it, by using it to solve itself, not resisting it or fighting against it, but taking the full advantage of its profound potential and significance. In daily living, therefore, now can become the solution to waste by giving the mind the full benefit of concentrated effort now each moment can be completed without something left over something to mortgage the future procrastination is pushing all of now into the future. Repentance is largely pushing all of now into the past. We should not necessarily say that the individual should not be sorry for his mistakes, but the only way to prove that we are sorry for them is to correct them now, and to do now what we should have done then. All the repentance is wasted, unless it leads to correction unless it causes the individual to reorient and do things now. To do many things now challenges the resource of the individual. He is confronted at this instant with a decision. He pauses. He is afraid to make the decision. So he puts it off. Or he says to his business associate, I'll think it over and let you know next week. He is trying to get hold of sufficient knowledge or sufficient clarity of insight to make a proper decision. Now this also leads us to a question. Hasty decisions by individuals incapable of making them 
may be injudicious. Hasty decision may cause future difficulty. The trouble here is that there is no experience, no ability to focus total resource. The individual should be able at any time to have his total resource available to him. Yet he cannot. And until he breaks through some phase of this boundary, he must be cautious in some matters, or else he will find himself in more difficulties than he can handle. Why is not total experience available to him? It always is. But the trouble with him is that he does not recognize the difference between total experience and thought. What he is trying to do is to solve his problem by rescuing his intellectual conceptions about the problem. Faced with an issue which requires immediate decision, the individual, like the attorney, is looking for some case histories to support his decision. He is looking into society, he is looking into all of the occurrences which have come to his attention, he is trying to remember all of the factors involved and trying to come to some kind of a decision. He will probably come to a decision, but it will be someone else's, which he has integrated the best he could and passed on. If he can find an expert, he will probably follow that person's advice. If he cannot find an expert, he will try to use traditional thinking as a means of protecting himself. As a result of this, he tells us that on the subject about which he must make a decision, his own personal experience is obviously inadequate. And wherever action performed now is not good, it means that the person's individual orientation is inadequate. Because what he should be able to do is to relax and instinctively make the correct decision. But he can't do it in most cases. First, he can't relax. That is the root of the whole thing. If he could relax, the total state of his being would move him. Now, there are decisions and conclusions that we arrive at every day of our lives, which come from various levels of our psychic nature, and which are not the result of what we might term thoughtful mentation. They arise from instinct, or perhaps intuition. If the individual is incapable of quietly relaxing and feeling the answer, knowing it totally, it means that he must continue the process of growth. He has got to correct these inabilities within his own nature, and they are his primary and immediate concern. Thus the product or the profit which rises from growth is measured in the terms by which it solves immediate problems or helps the individual to an immediate attitude which is sufficient and adequate and commendable. Where this is not available, the person is ignorant, regardless of how much he may believe that he knows on a variety of subjects. Experience further points out that the average individual is inadequate on the level of experience. Perhaps this is mostly because he cannot as yet learn to accept experience without interpreting it in terms of his own opinion. So his decisions are from his opinions and not from life. He is following attitudes and not nature. And as these attitudes are frequently in conflict with nature, he simply complicates his affairs makes life more difficult and the probabilities of comfort and security more remote. Time, then, 
has all of these potentials within it. And it is continuously teaching us the lesson. It is continually bringing home to our minds the tremendous need of disentangling consciousness itself from opinions on the one hand which represent more or less an heredity from the past and from fantasy or hallucination on the other hand which represents man's effort to explore the future unknown. Where there are no foundations, there are fantasies. Where the foundations are deep and wrong, there are opinions. And in both instances, the individual is crucified between these thieves, which destroy his vital and natural ability to make decisions. To make decision is to save time. The individual who faced with a problem immediately and quietly solves it, finds that he has an allotment of time at his disposal. This allotment has been saved by proper attitude. And it is also rescued from the fear-fantasy combination. In the case of a person under a heavy psychotic pressure, the individual may be wasting nine-tenths of his time vitalizing memory. In other words, he is re-suffering or re-experiencing some negative circumstance. Another individual may be wasting a great deal of his time simply by immediately personalizing everything which occurs. Everything that happens in nature hurts him, affects him. The weather is a personal tragedy in his life. The election is a personal tragedy in his life. That other people have minds of their own is a personal tragedy in his life. He is forever being hurt. Therefore, his entire life is spent as an apprentice nurse to his own aches. <laughs> Obviously, such a life is largely wasted. Then there is the person who, recognizing that his past is burdened with nightmares, is constantly trying to outrun them. In other words, he is trying to get away from himself. He is traveling as far as he can in every direction, totally unaware that his self is sitting on his back all the time like the old man of the sea. No one can escape himself. So he wastes his time attempting to keep his mind off of his own bad thoughts. If this goes on, he can be a comparatively useless individual and end in some slough of despond common to all of us. There are many persons who make various careers out of these compound mistakes. And to the degree that they do so, they find their time allotment has produced comparatively little good for them. They find that they grow old before their time. And, in though, and although their lives are seem to them to be much longer, they are meaningless in terms of significant events. There is only one lesson that these persons might learn or should learn, and that is the wrongness of their own way. On the other hand, there are those who, recognizing tendencies to these excesses, go to work on them immediately and refuse to tolerate such negations within their own natures. You cannot kill them out or these negations by willpower. You kill them out through the gradual unfolding of the experience factor. For experience is a mystery like now and as now can finally enclose past and present, experience finally reconciles right and wrong. 
Experience brings all incidents into order and makes out of the separate things that happen one magnificent total awareness. Man, therefore, has available to him the total of such experience as he has richly and wisely accepted. From this experience comes the power of constructive immediate action. And from this uh, constructive and immediate action comes man's victory over the time polarities. The highest and most constructive action of man, according to philosophy, is, is, is his experience of universal good. His personal experience of reality. Those mystics such as Plotinus who have reported to us the experience of reality have mentioned that although in man-made time these experiences might only be a second or two, that during the experience man suddenly apperceived and participated in total eternity. Time was swallowed up in a dimension of total awareness which extended through all departments and bound everything into the immediate total experience of being. Obviously nature has concealed somewhere in her plan this gradual growth of man toward total experience, which is a victory over life and death as he knows these things but is actually the achievement of life itself. Life is achieved from living and dying, but when it is achieved, the phenomenal causes of itself are absorbed into itself. Man must go perhaps a long time before he can fully justify his concept but he will gradually find that the building of integration within his own nature will remove one by one the causes of premature death. That is, death which is experienced as the result of conflict rather than as the result of the gradual, quiet exhaustion of resources. Those resources which are conserved last the longest, and man could certainly multiply his days and also make these days worth living. There is no reason to extend a span of misery. There is no desire of living longer unless we live better. There is no reason why we should have more time unless we know what to do with it and how to use it better than we are using the time we have. Thus the growth of man making more time necessary results in the development of those faculties and powers within himself by which more time is available. What man needs in order to grow he will have. He will not have better conditions because he wastes the one he has. But when better conditions are necessary, they will be available, because it is a basic law in nature that that which is necessary is always available. For the very necessity creates that which is needed. Every step in man's growth, the necessities which he contained within himself, have been magnificently met by nature, which has provided him with the means of attaining necessary ends. When the further growth of his own nature, the further integration of his own consciousness, the further usefulness of his own existence as a being, when these are real, nature will provide him with the additional time allotments. He can therefore build toward the final emancipation of himself in the time concept. But it's like most of the ultimates we dream of. It is not for now. 
But it is now that we must begin to plan because the achievement is not historical in terms of years. Man cannot say this condition will be a thousand years from now or ten thousand years from now because this timelessness has already been attained by a few. The time allotment therefore becomes qualitative time, not quantitative time. And qualitative time is the measure of interval necessary for the change of the essential nature of something, not its appearance, not its form. Qualitative time measures the degree of the growth of human consciousness, for one thing. And this growth is within a dimension of time which is strangely remote and imminent at the same time. Therefore, these attainments are not due merely to survival of an historical era, but qualitative growth by which, having achieved a certain quality, the individual has reached maturity. We measure maturity as having attained 21 years. All we are doing is talking about body. What we mean by maturity is the attainment of a certain level of consciousness. Thus time on the level of consciousness is measured in the de development and unfoldment of spiritual events in the consciousness of the individual. Some may achieve these ends by a more direct route than others, but always the direct route is available if the individual wishes it. Consequently, conscious dedication to principles and the conscious de resolution to live according to laws brings man into the pattern of qualitative time where he can grow and unfold according to his own capacities. And in this level, human time ceases to be very significant because each degree of growth may represent only an instant in the achievement, but the physical symbolizing of this through the evolution of forms might require millions of years. So as the Eastern philosopher tells us, the magnificence of consciousness adjustment by which man becomes immediate, immediately accessible and to him becomes also accessible the totality of consciousness. This is man's defeat of the time illusion which he knows materially. Thus growth is bringing man gradually into a series of immediate now experiences which are said to end or culminate in the concept of cosmic consciousness. And cosmic consciousness to the ancients was the symbol of a total consciousness of now extending throughout all of the areas of time and space and involving all of the eras or, uh, and epochs which we relate to past and future. The total consciousness or the awareness of divine being which is itself a now experience. So every time we make now victor over past or future and by philosophic adjustment become better integrated now, better adjusted, better able to perceive the beauty, the sublimity, and the universal opportunity of now. As these qualities grow within us, we become victors over time and gradually dispel the psychological pressures that have burdened our race since its development in history. All right, that does it. I'd like to call your attention to our subject for next Sunday morning, Human Consciousness as Will and Idea.
principle of volition, the principle of ideation, as we know it today, the human being and the relationship to this power within him which says, I will, I shall, this drive, this tremendous sense of individual resolution or determination. We're going to study that a little next week, and we hope that you will find it interesting. I'd like to also call to your attention that this afternoon at 2 o'clock at headquarters, the headquarters group study center uh, will have its uh, regular meeting at 2 o'clock. That is the local study group headquarters group. And the discussion will be devoted to publications and activities of the society, and it is open to the public, and all who are, in, are interested are invited to attend with the compliments of the group, so that those who are interested will find, I think, subjects for discussion on a philosophical, psychological, or religious level which will be of interest and value. May I also call your attention again to the counseling service offered by the Society. You can secure literature about it uh, as you go out if you are interested. You have problems or have uh, situations arising in which you would uh, like counseling, it can probably be arranged, and we suggest that you get in contact with the Society for details on this service. In connection with this morning, our book Questions and Answers might be of value to you. We also have a number of other used books on our table. They are other miscellaneous you'll have to browse, but I think you will find some that are interesting and valuable. I'd like also to call your attention to our booklet Culture of the Mind, which may be of service, and our book Twelve World Teachers, which will give a foundation under the concepts of the timeless life as it is expressed in the spiritual conviction of mankind. Also, our booklet, Super Faculties and Their Culture, might help you to get hold of some of the stray or loose ends of your own thinking processes, of course, providing there are any loose ends. We just hope there are not, but should there be any, we hope that you will tuck them in immediately. And we're very happy to have you with us and hope to see you next week.